I remember saying to somebody when they asked me why I wouldn't want to get married, I said, I do want to get married. I'm just not in a rush. And I was like, isn't the whole purpose of life to be happy? They were like, yeah. And I was like, so what's this desperate rush to get married? And afterwards it was like, oh my God, why did you say it in that way? They're going to think you're this really crazy, strong, independent, like driven woman. And I was like, I am. Like what, why do I have to hide that? I don't get it. Why do I have two different identities? It's just something I wear. It doesn't define me. And I think for women, we're very much like, how do you present yourself as a businesswoman? How do people take you seriously, Shivani? The facts are that women do majority Correct. of the childcare, the domestic work globally, three times more unpaid labor than yeah. men. It is a legitimate question For to sure. ask. Quite frankly, I would like to know it as well in terms of what do they do perhaps differently or yes. how do they cope? The burden does fall on women. Mm -hmm. And for men, it's like, oh, well, you you, you pick up your kids from school, that's amazing. The smallest of activity revolving around unpaid work, we praise men for. And the flip side is the negative almost social stigma that's Correct. associated for men was like, well, why are you not working? Why are you not earning how you're supposed to? The issues between men are still in that phase where it's like, well, I can't speak up because I'll look less manly. It's just often a question and it makes me think, why don't we ask men that? Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader? that your actions matter to those that look up to you. You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Shivani, what Hello. a pleasure to have you here. Such a pleasure to be here. I'm so nice excited for this. Yes. Well, you are the host of another podcast, yeah. A Millennial Mind. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really, really curious as to why did you decide to go with that topic? Why millennials? I think my original idea was going to be called the Indian problem. And okay. I found that to be quite negative because the reason for me starting the podcast was what can I share and what experiences do I want to share and change? And a lot of that rooted back to my culture. But what I realized on reflecting on that is it wasn't just to do with my culture, it was to do with everything. And so I was trying to think of a name and I thought millennial is good because I'm a millennial. And there was so much bad press at the time around millennials. Millennials are lazy, they spend too much money on avocado toast, blah, 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 blah. Um, and I was like, okay, I need to think of something related to millennial. And all of my ideas come when I'm either running or walking or doing some form of exercise. And one day I was running and I thought of millennial mind. I actually thought of millennial mindset and I thought, mm, there's something, I don't know. And then I just thought millennial mind. And then mm. it came up with that title because I wanted to talk around a lot of different topics. And I think a lot of the things I do talk about are to do with millennials. And that is a kind of my target audience. Mm -hmm. So it just fell into place. Mm. So through your podcast and the guests that you've had on the show, mm -hmm. what did you learn about millennials that maybe surprised you? I think there's such a misconception around laziness and there's also this misconception around we spend loads of money. And what I've learned from a lot of people is everyone works incredibly hard. And I think the good thing about this kind of new millennial slash Gen Z culture is a lot of people have side hustles. So a lot of people understand that I can't just wake up one day and do everything I love and get paid for it. So I'm gonna have a day job and I'm gonna have something on the side. And what I've seen with a lot of people I've interviewed is they've started out that way. But one of the biggest lessons they've taught me is to be authentically yourself. Everyone I've interviewed, successful or not, everyone I've spoken to has done everything with true authenticity mm. and by being themselves and not being fearful of who they truly are. What does that mean to be authentically yourself? 
I think for a lot of people, they know who they are. They just feel suppressed in a lot of ways. So for me, I'll just take myself as an example. I've always been quite outspoken and I suffer with being outspoken because I'm constantly told and I have been constantly told that I shouldn't say certain things or shouldn't say certain things from certain people or, you know, you're going to be classed as difficult or whatever it is. And for so long, I didn't talk about a lot of controversial things because I was scared. And now I have a platform in which I can speak about those things and inspire other people to also speak about those things. So whatever your kind of true authentic style is, mine is to talk around things when I see things are wrong, you should be able to do it. And I think a lot of people hide behind that because they're scared to face who they truly are mm -hmm. or they haven't done that inner work to find out what their superpower is. Mm -hmm. When you say that you were afraid to speak up and talk about those topics where, mm -hmm. why where did that come from as a child I've always been someone who has been outspoken which is why my parents told me to do a law degree and why everyone thought I should be a lawyer which is why I have a law degree but I've never actually become a lawyer and the reason for that was I would always speak about things openly and I and I truly believe in that you should always speak about things openly because not only can you learn and grow but you can also understand a different perspective now, as an Indian girl, from my experience, that isn't always welcomed because a lot of the time we are fed this narrative to be quiet, to listen, to be submissive, to not really speak your own truth because if that contradicts that of a man, then you're seen to be difficult. And no one wants their daughter or child or whatever to be seen as difficult. So a lot of the time when I would speak about things, it would always be shut down, whether that was within my community, whether it was in school, whatever that was, you know, we don't like people who give a difference of opinion and contradict us. If I said to you, Maria, you're really passionate about something and I'm like, mm, I don't believe in it. Naturally, mm -hmm. we have our backup. And so for a lot of people to be the outspoken one is not seen as a good thing. But actually going on a podcast and talking about things in a more of a, I guess, logical way without having such an emotional attachment to something, people can understand it a bit more. And it's not personal. And so speaking about it on a podcast is completely different to speaking about it in a conversation. So a lot of the things I speak about, people will resonate with, but it is sometimes hard to have that conversation one-to-one. -one. Mm. So what about a podcast makes it easier to have those conversations? It's not personal. So if I'm talking about an issue, I'm talking about it generally. I'm not talking about it from something that you've said to me. So if I have a conversation, so for example, my podcast about don't ask me when I'm getting married, that went viral. <laughs> and, you know, that podcast, if I was having a conversation with you personally, who's saying it from a place of love and care, you know, I just want you to get married because of X, Y, and Z. And I'm like, don't ask me. I don't know. You may take offense to that. I'm talking about it on a podcast and you'll understand it a little bit more because it's not personal to you. So talking about things generally on a podcast is much easier for people to absorb and to understand your perspective rather than having a one-to-one -one conversation with them because it is personal to them. Mm. And there's an emotional connection and attachment. Mm. I suppose in a way also with, with a podcast, you're, you know, with, especially with yours now, you're reaching wider and wider audiences. Mm -hmm. So in some ways you're already building your tribe. So you right. are finding people who resonate with the thoughts of being shared and yeah. what's happening there. Mm -hmm. And and in some ways, I would imagine that it's feeling more encouraging that, mm. yes, this is my place to be yes. sharing these ideas. I mean, I'm kind of putting words in your mouth, but um, is that is that how 100%. you feel? percent. I feel like sometimes I also feel like I put out a piece of content and I'm like, oh, this isn't very good. But, you know, I'll just put it out. And people are like, this is amazing. <laughs> oh, it's so well articulated. And I'm like, I didn't make sense in that. Like, what are you saying? But mm. I think, you know, as you grow an audience and as you say things that resonate with people, not everything has to be perfect. And that's a lesson that I always have to learn. You know, I don't have to say a sentence beautifully or perfectly for it to resonate with everyone. As long as my message is coming out clear and it's coming from a good place, that mm -hmm. is going to resonate with someone. Mm -hmm. And I think so many of us don't put out content. So many of us don't share our stories because we're so fearful of it not being perfect. And I think if you ask someone, do you think you're a perfectionist? They would say no. I was working with someone recently and they said, you're such a perf perfectionist with your podcast. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm like the least person to be perfectionist. Like I'm like not a perfectionist at all. I wouldn't define myself as that. And they were like, but you are with your podcast. And I was like, mm, not really. And they were like, you literally need everything down to a T. And I was like, yeah, of course. And they were like, so you are a perfectionist. And I was like, oh yeah, okay, maybe I am. And I think we don't define ourselves as, a, as perfectionists because we know it's impossible. But still so many of us, you know, spend ages doing something, record things three million times, and then we don't release it because we're like, it wasn't good enough. Mm. And I think that's the important thing is to take that jump, take that leap and try and mm. just see. 
And the best thing about podcasts is I see so many people making massive mistakes and they still release their content and it still gets loads of views and people still resonate with it. And it gives me that hope. I was watching somebody's podcast the other day, one of the top in the world, top five in the world. Start of the podcast, someone walked through the screen. <laughs> Throughout the podcast, the audio was like mm. here, so the, you can hear it. And they have one of the like top five podcasts in the world with a team of around 50 people to do everything for them. And I was like, I'm constantly comparing myself to people like this who have someone to do every little detail. And if they can make a mistake mm. and they can put out that content and they're not fearful, then why am I? Mm. And I really find it inspiring a lot of people do that because it makes you realize that everyone makes mistakes. Absolutely no one is perfect. I think it's it's fascinating how, you know, you were talking about comparing yourself to people who are so much further down the road, mm. but also how you don't call yourself a perfectionist. Yes. And to some extent, it's like, well, these are the, the, the high standards that I have for exactly. myself and for what I want to do. And yet... I don't admit that I'm a perfectionist, for yes. sure. It's a contradiction I think a lot of people face. Mm. You know, to say you're not a perfectionist is to kind of be like, well, it's okay if it goes wrong. But when something does go wrong, I'm like, oh my God, like this is a disaster. But I've kind of learned to navigate myself through those things. Like today has been an absolutely terrible day. I'm not even gonna list all the things <laughs> that have happened. It's not even 10.30, but I kind of rework it in my mind to be like, okay, well today can be, this morning was terrible. The afternoon's gonna be great. And the evening is going to be even better. Or I can sit here and say, my morning was terrible. My day is terrible. This is a bad day. Or I can reframe that in my mind to say a part of my day was bad. Mm. And you can reframe that with the content you have. Okay, this element wasn't good. Like I recorded a video the other day and the, I forgot to focus the camera on myself because I do it my, alone. So mm. I stand back from the camera. I purpose it. I had a plant in the back. I had a vase in the back. Thought I would make it aesthetic. What I didn't realize... Because the camera wasn't focusing on me. But I don't have someone at the other end to do that. Mm. I have to do it myself and then run to the screen and film. So I was thinking, you know, okay, the content, the quality isn't that good, but the content is good. And people messaged me that and said that, you know, Shwani, if the content is, if the quality is bad, it doesn't matter because your content is good. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I can't be so harsh on myself because I'm one person. I can't compare myself to a team of 30 people doing it. Is it something that you feel or is it something that you have to tell yourself over and over? I have to tell mm -hmm. myself over and over mm -hmm. because we have all have that inner critic. And I'm the first to critique myself when something goes wrong. So when I've spent so long trying to do this video, when I'm excited to release it, I export it onto my laptop and it's blurry and I'm like, oh my God. I either have two choices. I redo the video, which I don't have time. I don't upload it. Well, mm -hmm. three choices. I don't upload it or I upload it and I tell myself, okay, well, these were the circumstances. How can you change? Mm. So next time, maybe call someone and ask them to focus the camera on you. And I did do that. So it's not about critiquing yourself in that moment and just cutting everything out. It's about learning. And I think that's the importance in everything is that mm. how can you make it better the next time? And now I know. So it was a good thing that that highlighted that to me. And it's a good thing that that happened on a short video at home when I wasn't you know, so stressed out. The following week, I made sure it was better. And I think that's the important part. Mm. I mean, I totally resonate with the perfectionist and especially when it comes to a podcast, especially in the beginning, it's like, mm. oh, is that flower pot okay in the background? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, when the guests come in, because, you know, we shoot in my my home. Yeah. It's like, well, you know, is it really messy downstairs? And yeah. I have so much anxiety centered around all these Everything else centered around yeah. that. And then I realized that actually the perfectionist part isn't necessarily about making the podcast good, mm. but about the stress and maybe the nervousness I felt about interviewing a guest. Mm. And when I realized that, when that kind of penny dropped, I realized that I don't have to worry about any of the other things yeah. as long as I'm mentally prepared and genuinely connecting with the person in front of me. Yeah. And after that, that actually was so much easier than I didn't have to do these 100 million things. <laughs> and just by removing that made it so much better. But I totally resonate with what you're saying about, you know, like you want to get everything right. Yeah. But at the end of the day, 
you know, if you're filming a podcast all by yourself, you don't yeah. have someone behind the camera mm -hmm. or, you know, someone to kind of say, okay, your, your, your hair is out exactly. of place, you have lipstick on your teeth or exactly. whatever it is. Then now you I'm checking my teeth. <laughs> because I've been thinking about it. You don't have lipstick on your teeth. Great, thank you. Um, because you don't, you know, you, you can't control everything. Yeah. And as long as you are improving, as long as you're focusing on what really matters, exactly. then that's the most important thing. But I think to actually achieve that and to really feel comfortable in yourself, mm -hmm. I think that's really hard. It is. And mm. it's a process. You know, there's, everyone has an inner critic and everyone has someone who also believes in themselves. They have two parts of your body, right? Your two parts of your mind. And it's some days you have to listen to one more than the other. And, you know, generally with your inner critic, if you find yourself really critiquing yourself, you have to really bring that back and say, like, why am I being so harsh on myself? Would I speak to other people like this? So why am I being so cruel to me? Mm. And I suffer with that a lot with so many things that I do. I think, why did I do that? But then at the end of the day, I really do reflect and think, OK, I can choose to speak to myself in one of two ways here. One, you're human, you make mistakes, and it's totally normal. Look at everyone else in the world that makes mistakes and you're fine. What can you learn from it? And how can you make sure it doesn't happen again? And then that transforms me into being like, it's okay if I make mistakes. Mm. I'm not perfect. I'm okay with not being a perfectionist. Well, you're talking about being, you know, a person that also, is, you know, you're not, you don't exist in a vacuum. You yeah. come from a culture mm -hmm. where you are expected to behave and to look and to do things in a specific way right so for me that's almost a no-brainer that you will be critiquing yourself because it's mm. something that's reflected back at you from kind of like the people around sure. you how do you feel you know your background has shaped you oh tremendously I think it's it's really really impacted me in a positive and sometimes in a not so positive way mm -hmm. and I think that's with everyone you know especially within the culture and society I grew up in you really had to think about what other people said it was just like the number one thing mm -hmm. if you didn't go to a good good university it wasn't like how will that impact your life? It's what will other people say? Mm -hmm. If you're doing it into a good school, it was like, what will other people say? When you would say something, it would always be like, what will other people think of you? Mm -hmm. So I grew up with this a lot. And especially as a woman, I was incredibly conscious of everything I say. And I still feel that now. There are still certain groups of people in which I don't feel like I can say how I feel. And when I do say how I feel, it always comes back to me in a negative way. Mm -hmm. Why did you say it like that? And you know, as someone who's outspoken, the number one thing people will always target me for is the way I say things. Because generally you can't, generally in this world now, you can't target someone for what they've said anymore because you're seen to be, you know, you're saying it, you're just not seen to be understanding. But they can always target the way in which you say it. So I always try and say things now in, a, in the nicest possible way that I can. But I've, I'm a very expressive person. So I wouldn't speak, you know, like this. And that's just not the way I speak. I'm a very like, oh, my God, I'm, like, I didn't know that. Like, I'm just very animated. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think, you know, growing up, that has been difficult. Like, I remember saying to somebody when they asked me why I wouldn't want to get married. And I said, I do want to get married. I'm just not in a rush. And, you know, I'm happy right now. And I was 25, 26 at the time. And I was like, isn't the whole purpose of life to be happy? And they were like, yeah. And I was like, so what's this desperate rush to get married? And I said it in that way. And afterwards it was like, oh my God, why did you say it in that way? They're going to think you're this really crazy, strong, independent, like driven woman. And I was like, I am. Like, what? why do I have to hide that? It's like, I'm all, I don't get it. But I think that's changing now. And I think with some generations, you're never going to change their opinion. And that's okay. You need mm -hmm. to know when to speak up and when not to. Because often you're kind of just talking to a brick wall. And I've learned that also with age. Like you can't change everyone and you can't change everyone's opinion. But it is important to be yourself. And I've learned that throughout this year, more and more, every time I think I've become more confident in myself to just speak my mind and not everyone is going to like you. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. And that's a lot of reprogramming that's had to have happened to understand that when you have, let's say 5 million people watching your video, 10% of those people don't like you. It's fine. <laughs> like, it's okay. It's just, uh, it's just life. It is life. I don't like everyone. So how mm -hmm. can I expect everyone to like me? Mm -hmm. And I think that's just an acceptance piece. How do you deal with people who don't like you? I mean, now, especially as you are, you know, getting yeah. more views, mm -hmm. you know, being more visible. Mm -hmm. So naturally there are going to be people who don't like what you have to say or 
for or even how you look or you know mm-hmm. anything for how sure. do you deal with that well i think you know there's a lot of people that say a lot of positive things to me i would not even say one percent of people say negative things i'm really lucky but there are obviously some comments that people will say like oh you're just so modern and i'm like okay but why do i think that's a negative thing or mm-hmm. someone people like recently i've been a little bit unwell and i have lost a lot of weight and I'm, when I say a lot, I mean, because I was never that big, me losing five kilograms is quite a lot. And a lot of people would comment and say, you look ill or like you need to eat something. And that used to make me feel upset because now I'm very conscious when I take a photo, like, do I look, do I look too ill or whatever? But I think at the end of the day, I feel like I am healthy now. And so if somebody comments and says that, at least I feel healthy. But when I was unwell and I felt unwell and people were saying that you look ill, that did trigger me. But I have to then remember at the same time is it's two people commenting on my post. Mm -hmm. There's another 60 people saying nice things when TikTok is the worst. Oh my God, people are so cruel on TikTok. The things that they say. Mm -hmm. Now I just kind of laugh. Now I just genuinely find it quite funny that if you're sitting there at home typing this horrible (laughs) comment, like you're just a bit sad. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was someone that commented on my podcast with Stephen. And they said, you know, God, you're just like, I can't remember what they said. They were just like, I've never seen someone gagging for it more. Like, can't believe that. You literally are like obsessed with this random guy who doesn't do anything or something like that. And I was like, do you really think that about him? Like genuinely, I just genuinely shocked. And I was like, seems like you're having a bad day. Hope your day gets better. They didn't reply. Mm -hmm. Because when you treat people, and this is so cliche, everyone says it, when you treat people with compassion, they have nothing to say to you. And that is the truth. But as much as people say it, it can be hard to take on negative comments. It can be hard to look at them. And I'm someone who checks my phone the first thing when I wake up, it's terrible, but I never check TikTok. I always wait till the afternoon to check TikTok because I'm like, I can't check those comments. But Mm -hmm. you have to really think about like, are people just saying things because they disagree with you? Mm -hmm. They're gonna have a difference of opinion. It's okay. Someone is not gonna believe in the same things that I believe in. A lot of people with the marriage video, 5.5 million people saw that on Instagram. There were probably, I don't know, 50 comments of people saying like this is why you're never going to get married this is why you're never going to find someone but I'm not insecure about that Mm. I'm not insecure about finding someone I'm with someone but even if I wasn't I would never I've never been insecure about that so I'm not going to let those comments affect me the only comments that can affect you are the ones that you feel insecure about and so it's always on you Mm. if you feel like you're selling a rubbish course and someone calls you out on it then you're going to feel it if you feel like you're giving so much value to people and you're not selling a rubbish course and someone says your course is rubbish, it didn't work for you. Do you know what I mean? Like it's all about your own insecurities. And I think if someone's comment impacts you, it's a good time to reflect and think, why is that hurting me? Do I believe that about myself? Have I been told this before? Or is it the fact that I just am wanting everyone to like me Mm. and then I'm a people pleaser? There's definitely something about being triggered and Mm. you're right in terms of something that is deeply personal to you that perhaps you do have an insecurity about. Yeah. If someone makes a negative comment, you're going to pay much more attention to For it. Sure. But then also it's going to wound you much deeper. Mm-hmm. Had a, a very interesting author on the show the other day yeah. who was talking, we were talking about vulnerability. And I'm sure I exactly agree with everything that he said. Okay. But... And we're talking about vulnerability and leadership Mm -hmm. and how when you are in that, you know, when you're in sort of deeply vulnerable state to then be vulnerable publicly can be like, he doesn't believe that's the right thing for a leader. I mean, we kind of dug into it. We dug a little bit into it off the podcast. Okay. But I thought that was an interesting thread in terms or just an interesting thought in terms of the vulnerability. And when you're saying Mm. when you felt that you know, you've, you've lost a lot of weight and it was something that, you know, you, you obviously were conscious about and it's something that, you know, you felt it was hurtful when people were commenting on that. And then to, and I don't know how, what your experience is, like whether you feel like, well, it's better to just kind of come out and say, well, yes, I am feeling vulnerable about that yeah, or whether it will be more helpful to you to process that in yourself first Mm. and then deal with it publicly later. So it reminds me of an example of, you know, the problem I had with people saying that, oh, you look ill or whatever. It's like, you have no idea what I'm going through. I could be literally being diagnosed with something Mm -hmm. and be going through it. And Mm -hmm. instead of you asking, are you okay, Shivani? 
you're saying I look ill, I need to eat something. Well, how do you know what's going on? And this happened actually at a wedding where someone said, you're looking so ill, like something is wrong. And I was like, yeah, I know, I'm going through some tests with some doctors. And then someone else jumped in and said, she looks awful, doesn't she? She looked much better two years ago. And that was someone close to me. So afterwards I turned around and I said, you know, I'm not feeling very like, good about the way I look. It's not intentional. And a lot of people, I think for women, when you lose weight, it's like, oh my God, the dream. Like every mm. woman's dream is apparently to lose weight. You know, people literally are obsessed with it. And so naturally people think when you lose weight, it's intentional because it's what you want. A lot of the time you lose weight and it's not what you want because you don't feel that great. And so I took this person to the side and I said, you know, I've been feeling insecure about it. Mm -hmm. You know that I feel upset. I'm not happy at this weight. So do you think it's the right thing to say I looked better a year ago and I looked much better previously and I don't look very nice now and you've been telling me for months to put on weight when you know that I can't? I was like, do you think that's the right approach? And they were like, no, I was just saying that. And I was like, but you're making me feel worse. Mm -hmm. And as someone who's close to me, I don't expect that. And I think on social media, I haven't even addressed it. I'll say it in this podcast, but I'm not going to go on social media and say, hey guys, I'm having tests and hey guys, I was a little bit unwell and I'm waiting for the results back because I don't know what it is. Mm. And the people who message me saying you need to eat whatever, they don't affect me because I don't know them. So someone says that to me, I'm not feeling insecure about it. But when people I know say it to me and they think it's intentional and then they're trying to work out this deeper reason as to why it's happening, it's just a bit like stop. You know, it's like, stop trying to dissect it. Like yeah. I'm telling you, I'll tell you the truth. But I think, you know, it's really important to have those conversations and to be vulnerable. And if I'm like, if I find out there is something bigger, then I would share that to say, you know, that's what's happened. But for people who message me here and there, I mean, it's not a significant amount of people who message me, but for people who message here and there, I'm not going to reply to every single comment and just say, yeah, mm. okay, this is what's going on. You don't need to know. There's something about being visible and, you know, on the one hand, you want to be sharing your ideas and your stories and to some extent your journey and, you know, the lessons that you have learned. But on the other hand, there's like how much of your own personal journey that you want to kind of keep to yourself mm -hmm. and, you know, having social media and having that big platform to be able to share those ideas is amazing because you can impact and help so yeah. many people mm -hmm. but at the same time it opens you up to you know very negative criticism mm -hmm. and I think that's that's a very difficult line to toe and it's like how much Do you share you share and also how much you yeah how much of yourself you really kind of give on that platform one of the things I don't remember where, I, maybe it was on one of your YouTube episodes, mm -hmm. you were talking about how, you know, when you post a picture of yourself in a bikini, you get so many likes <laughs> and then, you know, you, you know, you post a podcast and then, you know, it's an amazing content and yeah. incredible story. And there is, you know, not that much interest. Yeah. And for me, what's really curious about, well, first of all, this, you know, this idea of women being judged on their looks mm -hmm. and then also being a professional. So somebody who yes. has something, you know, very interesting to share and they're really contributing a lot to society. And how do mm -hmm. you, how do you balance those two and how do you feel about that? Well, that actually clip was from my podcast with Stephen. Right. And it's really interesting you say that because it's the complete opposite now. All of the podcasts in which I'm speaking will get the highest engagement, mm. every single one. Mm -hmm. And even more sometimes than my guests. And that was never the case. And I realized that the thing is with these things, you have to be persistent, you have to be consistent. And it's very easy to blame everything else. Oh, the algorithm doesn't like me. Oh, you know, uh, people prefer the pictures of me in my bikini. Well, maybe because it's more aesthetic. So when I was filming in my first studio before I went to LA, yeah, of course, My, if you look back at those videos, they're awful to watch. I don't even want to watch them. No subtitles, horizontal, not zoomed in, you know, not giving key information. And now I'm able to extract the key information, add subtitles, make it look more aesthetic, change the thumbnails. You know, everything helps in terms of you need to make sure that you're pushing content that is going to be valuable to people and present them in an aesthetic way. My podcast isn't the most aesthetic, but you can always blame a platform and you can always blame other things. 
And you can always also give up on the things that you really want to do because everyone else isn't liking them. But it's important to always go back to your values and your purpose. So for me, I knew that the content I was saying was great. What was the problem? And I needed to find that out. It wasn't the content. It wasn't what I was saying. It was how I was presenting it. Mm -hmm. And having that reflection and having that understanding was really, really pivotal to me because I remember even with my Zoom podcasts, I remember I would upload them and I would get like 10 views, Mm. 12 views. Mm -hmm. And I would feel so disheartened because I would think I've got these amazing guests. Like, why is this happening? And then one day I was like, have I ever watched one of my podcasts on Zoom? No. Have I ever watched anyone else's podcast on Zoom? No, I hate them. They're boring. Why would I want to watch that? It's no interaction. You can't really see anything. It's literally just two people talking at at each other. And it feels like you're watching a boring YouTube video. Mm -hmm. So I was like, if I find them boring, then everyone else is going to find them boring. And to take that initial step and to invest in a studio was difficult for me. I'd been doing the podcast for two years. I'd made absolutely no money from it. And I was like, now I'm going to invest even more into it. So for what? But my mission and my value is I know I'm having powerful conversations and I know they're going to help people. Mm -hmm. And because I was started in March and I was consistent, that changed everything for me. And because I started investing in that, that also changed my audience's interest in me. So going back to your question around, do you present yourself in a way in which, you know, wait, sorry, what was your question? Like, I think it's about balancing because, you know, you're a, you know, very good looking woman. Mm -hmm. And you're also, (laughs) well, I mean, that's my opinion, right? Mm. I mean, some people may may think differently. I think yeah. I think that, and you are also, you know, a businesswoman who mm-hmm. you know has had a successful career, is having a successful career, and mm-hmm. also doing something. I don't want to say different because I don't think that's really describing what you do. But you know, you're following your own path, right. and you are you know, talking about personal issues, business issues, Mm -hmm. you're a coach as well. So you have this professional side to you. Yeah. And my question was like, well, how do you, how do you balance both, especially when it comes to social media and to some extent being also judged on what you look like? So balancing both, you mean in terms of the way I present myself personally on social media and then in a business way too? I don't, not sure if it's necessarily... I think it's more about how you feel inside with regards to, I guess, having both of those identities. Which identities? (laughs) The business side and the the bikini wearing one, for example. Well, I think my, my pushback on that question is why do I have two different identities? Because I wear a bikini when I'm at the pool, just like I would wear a dress if I was in the heat. And just how I would wear perhaps a suit if I'm in an office. It's just something I wear. It doesn't define me. And so I think we have these ideas of business women. But would we ask that same question to a guy? Oh, how do you feel about wearing shorts by the pool? I don't think we would. And I think for women, we're very much like, how do you present yourself as a business woman? How do people take you seriously, Shivani? If on your Instagram, you have a picture of your bikini. Right? And I think we all have that perception. I definitely had that in the beginning as well, was should I post a picture of me in a swimsuit? Will people take me seriously? And I think absolutely you should. Whatever you feel comfortable with. I don't sit there posing with my leg up in the air and my hand here on a boat. You know, that's what I don't feel comfortable with. But if I'm on holiday and I'm wearing a bikini and I want to take a picture of it, I'll post it. The purpose of my page isn't to promote bikinis. It's not to promote swimwear. It's not to promote, you know, certain things. But there is different things that I do promote, like clothes or beauty or fashion or hair oil or whatever it is, because that that makes me who I am. Mm -hmm. So I don't see it as like a split identity. I see it as an all in one. And I think we need to move away from this definition of a businesswoman only posting herself around business to be taken seriously. She can be herself and authentically herself and present her way in whatever way she wants to in order to be taken seriously. Mm, I totally agree with you. I mean, for me, it's, I suppose, it's pushing you a little bit in terms of just going yeah. down that route because because of something that you mentioned. Mm. And I suppose it's something that I think about myself in yeah. terms of, well, will I be perceived yes. in a bad way if I post certain things? And that conversation happens in my head and I Definitely. have to... 
make a decision on myself. And I, and I do hold myself back when it comes to mm. things like that. Um, I can imagine. And but I, think... I don't, I don't pass judgment on other women. And right. I'm really glad that that's you great. said that because to me, that's what's important in terms mm. of, you know, feeling secure within yourself. Yes. And, you know, it's like, that's who I am. This is what I enjoy. This makes me feel happy. Then right. That's, that's yeah, exactly, I don't have a split identity. Yeah, and so. I think we do that often as well for mothers. So on podcasts, you'll always ask a mother, not you, but generally, you'll always be asked a mother, how do you manage? Like having two kids and working. Mm. Do we say that to fathers? I do ask fathers Not now. you personally, but generally, <laughs> But right? generally we yeah. don't. But I'm in two minds about that question because... Well, the facts are that women do majority Correct. of the childcare, the domestic work. They Correct. do, I think, I don't know, it's like three times globally, three times more unpaid labor than yeah. men. It's so amazing. it is a legitimate question For to sure. ask. And quite frankly, I would like to know it as well in terms of <laughs> what do they do perhaps differently or yes. how do they cope? But the fact of asking that question in the first place and to women rather than yes. to men highlights the fact that there is such an difference. underlying issue and yeah. part of the question should be well how do we tackle that yes. and instead of addressing it to just the well, women exactly. we need to be addressing that to everyone because when unpaid work and the things that you do that contribute to society mm. are acknowledged mm -hmm even though they're not being acknowledged financially, maybe, but it's a massive contribution to society. Yeah. You know, we need to pay respect where it's due. For sure. And to give credit to that. So definitely. Yeah. And um, I think we we ask women that question because like you said, it the, the burden does fall on women. Mm -hmm. And for men, it's like, oh, well, you look you look, you pick up your kids from school. That's amazing. Wow. You know, smallest of activity revolving around unpaid work we praise men for. And I think the question obviously, like like you said, needs to go on to say, well, how do you cope? And when you hear a man saying, Oh, I do just fine, then you ask the other question of, how does your wife cope then? Mm. You know? You know what? Again, I'm in two minds about it because I've been thinking about this quite a lot. And in my circle, I do find that the the men, the fathers are contributing quite yeah. a lot. And when it comes to sort of unpaid work, I think there is the flip side as well for men where, okay, we might praise them or we might think that I was like, oh, he's, you know, taking their, you know, his kids to school. Yeah. But then the flip side is the, the negative, almost social stigma that's Correct. associated for men was like, well, why are you not working? Why are you not earning how you're supposed to? So I think, oh, and that's something that I don't think that gets talked about because mm. these are the, this is what happens between men, I would anticipate. Yes. And they tend to not discuss those matters as women do. I think as women, we have become much more vocal, mm. whereas the issues between men, I still in that phase where it's like, well, I can't, I can't speak up because I'll look less manly. Yes. I mean, that's a conversation for, yeah. for another, for that's another day, but that's, that, that's just makes me want to think from a different perspective. Like yeah. how would that be perceived? And also there are a lot of men, like you say, that do help. And a lot of men that don't fall into that narrative. And it's very easy to categorize men and women into these narratives. And mm. I don't think we should be doing that. Mm. But just from the conversations I've seen online, it is, there is, like you say, like a statistic that says women do the majority of unpaid work. And so it's just often a question and makes me think, you know, why don't we ask men that? Mm. How do we change that? You having a podcast as millennial mind so which mm -hmm. is which is centered around a specific identity of a millennial so you know i'm assuming that identity is very important to you and through the conversation with you now that really you know you're quite set not set but you're quite confident and quite you know um you know you feel like you really know who you are how would you describe your identity in five words Oh gosh, I'm not sure. Put you on the spot there. I'm not sure. I mean, it's interesting you think, like, I know who I am. I feel like I'm always discovering different parts of myself every day. But I think, back to your question of how I identify myself, I would say I am someone who is really strong. I would say I'm someone who's really independent, like fiercely independent. But that sometimes hasn't worked in my favor because I find it hard to be dependent on other people. I would say I am someone who is very compassionate. I'm very thoughtful, a bit too thoughtful sometimes. And I would say that I would hope that I'm inspiring. 
So I hope, you know, also to be that I'm kind. And I, I think there's situations in which I perhaps haven't been in loads of situations, but it's something that I would hopefully people would say about me is like she was kind. Yeah. Talking about this independence, mm. because another guest on the show that we had written, co-written a book, which was talking about seven frenemies. He's identified seven qualities of where a person can be. And each one is a strength, but in different situations, it's also a weakness. Definitely. And this independence for me was one of the strong ones and something mm. that I felt that I have battled with quite a lot in the sense that, well, with hyper independence and, you know, being kind of like the, the responsible one and sort of yes. relying on yourself, then there is this idea of like not accepting help, not even asking for Correct. help, don't even get that far, where you don't even accept it when it comes your way. Mm. And in certain circumstances, it's not a strength any longer. Correct. And I found that really interesting to think of, you know, of it being almost like a polarizing thing. Mm. And is that the reason what you don't want to get married? I do want to get married. I think people have this <laughs> <Now>. perception <laughs> that I don't want to get married. Mm. I do want to get married. I'm mm. just in no rush. Mm. And I don't think people have the right to ask me every single second, why don't you get, why don't you mm. want to get married? Like, why is it, what's the timeline? I've, I've been in a relationship. I'm in a relationship. When I'm ready, the time will come. Like, it's, it's not saying I'm not ready right now or like I don't want to be in it. And I think that's the hardest part about that is everyone questions you because you're independent. Everyone's like, we don't get married right now or like you're not happy in your relationship or something must be wrong because mm -hmm. you should know by now. Women know in the first three months, men know in the first second apparently mm -hmm. from meeting you. And we pu push all of these narratives on people. And my point is, is just leave people alone. Stop asking every mm. single second when someone's getting married because it fits into your timeline. I'm gonna be 30 next year. Maybe I'll get married at 55, who knows? Maybe I'll get married at 30, maybe I'll get married tomorrow. Mm. I don't know. Mm. It's not my choice, it's not my decision. You know, unless I was gonna propose, which I don't wanna do. But at the end of the day, people constantly asking that to a woman can really make her feel really low because mm -hmm. it can make her feel like the partner that she's with doesn't want to invest in her. The partner that she's with doesn't want to commit to her. And actually, why is she not pushing him? Mm -hmm. And this is why you see a lot of women, especially on TV, you see this narrative, oh, please propose to me, please propose to me. And it's just like, why? Mm -hmm. Why are you so desperate in this moment, in this period of your life to get married? Is it because of other people? Is it because other people are questioning you or is it because you really love this person and you are 100% sure you want to spend the rest of your life with them? And we very quickly muddle that. Mm. And that's why you're seeing so many people get divorced now because the pressure is to have a lovely wedding. The pressure is to get that Instagram grid of like six pictures of your wedding. Mm. The pressure is to say, oh, I got married here and this was the dress I wore and these were the shoes I wore. And for a lot of girls, that isn't the person they want to spend the rest of their life with. It's the person they think they should spend the rest of their life with. This word should for me is like, should be, should be banned <laughs> <laughs> because <clears throat> it's something that comes from the outside, right? It's something that is being, you know, you're being told that this is what you're supposed to do. Correct. This is what good looks like. This is what a happy life looks like. And then you're forgetting what's actually really important to you. Mm -hmm. What is, what do you actually want yeah. as opposed to what the society imposes on you? Right. And it's, it's interesting because I don't relate to this concept of like, when are you getting married? Because now I feel kind of, oh, maybe I should feel good about this because I've mm. never really been pushed into that. Yes. I've never felt, oh, when is it going to happen? Yeah. And I felt like I had so much freedom with regards to that, exactly. that I could genuinely just be myself mm. and make a decision when the time, time is, is right. right. Exactly. It is right. And to some extent, I almost don't even understand yeah, why imagine. that's even a question. Like, yeah. Why would it even be annoying, annoying or yes. hurtful? Yeah. I think in the video when I explained it, and let's just, this isn't me, but let me just say like, let's just say, for example, I was with someone for three years. And within these three years, we are 26 and 28. And at 26, I feel like everyone is saying, you know, my community is all of the women in the community that I've been part of generally got married but between 20 and 26, 27. And so they're only seeing it from a place of when are you getting married? 
But let's say, for example, you're going through a really, really tough time with this person at the moment and you're on the brink of deciding whether you're going to be together or not. And someone's like, when are you getting married? And you're like, oh, I'm not sure. Like, we're just we're just having fun. We're dating. And it's like, oh, so he's not serious about you. Oh, does his family not like you? Oh, you know men know it within three months. You guys should have had the conversation by now. How do you think that makes that person feel when they're going through a tough time with their partner? And I think lo loads of little comments like that constantly said to you, when are you going to have children then? You're going to be an old mom. Do you want to be old? I was once told, you know, do you want to look old at your wedding? Your photos <laughs> won't look nice. Who, what are you going to wear? Mm -hmm. You're going to put on weight. And it's like... All of these negative things, if they're fed to you constantly... It hasn't even happened yet. hasn't even happened yet. Mm -hmm. And you're already thinking, I'm not going to be able to have kids. Or maybe he doesn't like me. And the slightest amount of doubt can cause such a big deal. Mm -hmm. So if somebody says, oh, you know, men know within six months. And that day, your boyfriend or your girlfriend forgets your anniversary. Or, I don't know, forgets to buy you a present for Valentine's Day. You're like... Well, you know, everyone else is telling me that you should know within three months. It's been two years, only two years, and you haven't even got me a Valentine's Day present, which means you don't love me. You're just going to overthink those comments. Mm -hmm. And you never know what someone is going through. And you never know what someone is feeling in that moment. And so constantly asking, I'm not talking about if one person asks you once. I'm saying like, as an Indian girl in a community, I've been asked that question. I couldn't even tell you how many times from the age of 23. And when, and when you're single and you're above a certain age, people are like, what's wrong with you? You're too fussy. They blame you. They attack you. They attack who you are. And they start saying, like, you're never going to find someone. You're going to be left off the shelf. You know, you think you're pretty now, but you won't be pretty in 10 years. And then when are you going to find someone? I think the reverse is And then is you're like not going to be able to have kids. And no one's ever going to marry you. And you're just like, what on earth? All do these things. And people forget, like... The reason for a lot of people to get married is because they feel happy being married. And there's a lot of women out there, I'm not one of them, who doesn't want to be, who don't want to be in a relationship. Mm. I love being in a relationship, but I'm not in this desperate need to get married. It will happen when the time is right. And it doesn't mean the time is not correct at the moment. Mm. It just means it hasn't happened yet. And it's just no need to constantly be pushing and asking when are you going to get married? Because you just don't know what someone's going through. Mm. I think it's, with being pushed into doing anything exactly and being a woman and feeling like your only value to society is to get married mm -hmm. is to have children mm -hmm. is to look beautiful because you better do this now before exactly. you're not attractive anymore and you're not going to be good for anyone in 10 years time mm -hmm. and how do you feel about that how do I feel about people labeling women like that? Yes. Absolutely ridiculous. Mm. I think it's shocking, really, that people still think in that way. And whether you think about it directly or indirectly, subconsciously or consciously, there is all that implication because there is this desperate need that if you're unmarried as a woman, that you have to get married. Mm. Like, what will you do? It's like a lot of the time I hear people say that, like, oh, it's so sad. I feel so sorry for her. Why do you feel sorry for her? Is she happy? Mm -hmm. And I hear people say it all the time. And sometimes it's not even conscious. It's just in your subconscious to feel sorry for a woman if she's not married. Mm -hmm. You have men that are 35 with a beer belly growing out and you don't feel sorry for them. <laughs> so I'm like, why is it they so much? They still have time. Like, right, they still have time. Mm -hmm. And like, why do you feel so sorry for women who mm -hmm. aren't married? Because... It's very different if someone comes to you and says, I'm really struggling to find someone and I really want to get married. I really want to have kids and I'm worried about my biological clock. Because let's face it, that is true. That is true. You do have a clock on when you like can reproduce with like, there's like, a, I know after 35, it gets harder. And I understand that. It doesn't mean it's impossible, but yes, it gets a little bit harder. So I understand if some women are worried about that. I get it. But there are some women who are like, I am truly happy with being who I am. And I'm truly happy being 37 and not having a relationship. You guys look all miserable with your three kids and your husband. I'm happy. And I don't judge you and think you're a loser. So stop judging me and saying you feel sorry for me. I think there are statistics to show that women at a certain age are actually happier yeah. being single yeah. than being in relationships. Well, you're married and have kids. I'm sure there's mornings where you wish you had a bit <laughs> alone <it's>, time. <laughs> you know, you choose your challenges, right, in right. life and you choose what you tolerate and what's important to you. Exactly. And I think this is where, 
it's very important for me to for to encourage women to carve their own paths exactly. in life and to make choices and but we also come from it from a very privileged position like we Correct. both live in london you know mm-hmm. we're exposed to seeing how you know you know some of the most privileged people live right. and also having opportunities and i don't think that's the same everywhere else it's not and you know at least we can make the most of the opportunities that we do have here mm-hmm. which leads me on to the question because you were with a con- i think a consultant at- yes i can't know atos. Atos. atos yeah, yeah. um And you've recently quit. Yes. Tell me about that. Well, it was, you know, I started my podcast with absolutely no intent to monetize it. And I remember when I started it, everyone was like, it's just a hobby. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, yeah, obviously. Uh, You're never going to make any money from it. But then I remember like seeing other podcasts, the massive ones and seeing, well, they are making money from it. And I was like, okay, well, one day, who knows? It'll be a dream. Just kept on going. And with my podcast, I did seasons, which was a mistake. Because once you get people out of the routine of listening to your podcast, it's very hard to get those listeners, listeners back. And so that was a big mistake I made, actually. It was doing season after season after season. And in March this year, I said to myself, right, I'm going to invest into this. I'm going to make sure that I release a video every week, no matter what. And let's see where it goes. And within three months of being consistent, I saw tremendous results. Now, what people think about is, oh, I started my podcast this year, doing it in a studio, I work for three months and everything will change. No, that's that's not true. Because when people go back and they see I've been doing it for two years, they get to see the conversations I've been having. And so there is no magic formula in a way of which you can just decide one day you're going to go full time. You have to be ready. I took a sabbatical last year. And at that time, I was doing a lot of stuff at home, had a lot of personal stuff going on. And I couldn't focus on the podcast either. And so... I almost was so scared to go full time. And my family were very worried about me going full time. It wasn't something that they were like, yes, do it. You know, they're very concerned. They're still very concerned. Because the thing is, when you're an entrepreneur, your income isn't guaranteed. And you think that one month you're gonna earn, I don't know, 20,000 pounds, the next month you'll earn 200 pounds. And you have to be okay with those ups and downs. You have to be okay with understanding that. And for me, I was never okay with it. And it took me ages and ages and ages to finally say to myself, if I don't do this now, when am I ever going to do it? And do I want to be a partner at a management consultancy firm? No. But do I want to be the best podcaster in the world? And the answer is yes. And so I thought, I definitely know I don't want to do this. And I'm not sure if I can achieve this, but let me try. And I've quit now for about a month. It's been one month since I've had a paycheck from my company. (laughs) And everything has been okay. Like, it's fine. You know, you're going to be okay. And I think I just reinforced that into my mind. And for two and a half years, I didn't have a sponsor. I quit my job and I got the sponsor. Mm. And I think you have to let go of certain things. Like how you say you have to close a door to open a new one. Mm. And I really remind myself of that. So even next month or the month after, if I'm not doing so well, it's okay. I never know what's going to happen. Mm. Do you say you're go- you're going to be thirty next year? Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about your age per se, yeah. but I went through a similar conversation in my head when I was just about to turn thirty, and I was thinking, well, I can continue down this route. I can just, you know, you know, be in the recruitment industry mm-hmm. forever. You know, I'm good at what I do. But let me just try. And it's like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Exactly. But for me, it was really interesting because it was leading up to my 30. And I felt really, really good about turning 30. For me, it felt I was only just about to kind of reach my kind of adult years. And I Mm. almost felt like a coming of age to some extent. But that mark of like that decade is coming and it's exciting. And for me, it felt like a new chapter in my life. And it was... Because I was turning 30, I was like, you know what? Mm. Just want to see what happens. Like, life's too short. I'm Mm. dreading becoming 30. Are you? Yeah. I think, again, I put so much expectation on what I wanted to achieve by that time. Right. And I thought I'd have so much more by that time. But as much as I feel that, I still won't pursue the things that just for the timeline. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Like, Mm -hmm. I won't be like, oh, I have to do this because I thought I was going to do it. I haven't, I haven't done that. And I think that scares me a little bit. Like, gosh, I'm 30 next year. But at the same time, I think about when I was 28 and how much you can do in one year. So I'm like, I still have time. I feel like you're so young. (laughs) Oh my God. No, I don't feel like I am. I just turned 40 and I've, oh my gosh, I feel like you're going through 
I feel like you're going through now <laughs> about turning 30, maybe to what I was feeling when I was turning 40. But That's maybe, so funny. maybe it's like the pandemic, having kids. Yes, exactly. Having completely change your identity exactly. in your head or just to come I suppose it's like grief to some extent yeah. like there's a certain part of my identity is no longer there yeah you know being fiercely independent it's sort of mm-hmm. still there but now I cannot be completely Gosh. independent because I have people who depend yes. on me that's and, my fear <laughs> and that is it only came a few years into the being of the parent as opposed Mm. to straight away because I think I was still trying to operate the same way or thinking in my head that I could and actually I had to change my (laughs) expectations and perceptions of what I could be doing Mm. but it's for the better yeah talking about age (laughs) and as I said I feel like you're so young oh thank you well you are and I feel like I'm young I you know even though I went through this phase of like oh my god I am 40 what does that what does that mean yeah but I still think that's really young yeah there's still so much to do to do for sure I mean if you really think about it until you're Okay, retirement age, what, now 65? Mm-hmm, that's mm-hmm. 25 so much years. To yeah, like, you're all right. <laughs> well, that's, that's a lot of time. That's more than I've been in, in, in business than I've been working. But in any case, what advice would you give, like looking back now, and maybe, you know, your kind of early 20s, like what advice would you give yourself now? Believe in yourself. You know, I don't know if you've seen King Richard. Have you seen the movie? King Richard. You have to watch I'm it. I'm not good with titles of movies. It's about it's Serena and I'll... Venus Williams. <laughs> oh, and their story. no, I have not. I watch I've the trailer it, actually, yeah. every single morning. Mm. Every single morning I'll watch it. Because in that movie, the dad truly believes in his children that they are going to be the number one tennis players in the world. And they believe it themselves. When the, every single person told them that they couldn't do it, and everyone said it's impossible, they had no money, and now... Every single thing that he wrote down came true. Most things. But, you know, for someone to plan someone else's life, their own child's life, from when they're living from six people in a bedroom to now being the number one tennis players, getting a 12 million pound contract when that, when she was 14, it's crazy. And I think so many of us have so many dreams and we don't do them because we let everyone else's opinions drown out those dreams. And when I was younger, I always used to think, like, I don't know what it was when I was younger, but I always used to think, like, I'm this, I'm going to be successful. I don't know what it was. I was never fearful that I was going to ever have to rely on someone. And I think it was drilled into me as a kid. And I think often when people subjectively think you're good looking, they think you're going to rely on a man to do everything for you because you're good looking, so you'll be with a rich guy. You know, and you are fed that narrative. And mm-hmm. from a young age, I was never fed that narrative. It was always like, you better be someone who can handle it yourself. And I think because my dad isn't someone who's like treated me as like a princess, I grew up in a house with three boys and you would think as the only girl I'd be a princess, but I wasn't. I was just treated like one of the boys, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's why I am so strong is because I was raised in that environment to not rely on anyone or anything. And growing up, I was always like, I have to do everything myself. Like I have to make sure that I am successful. And for some reason, even though I was rubbish in school, even though I didn't get the best grades, I always thought I was going to be successful. And I remember when I was like 21, 22, that like fear started to kick in. What if I'm not going to be, what am I going to be? What should I do? And I wish, I wish, I wish I started this much earlier. And I wish I believed in myself, even at the start of this journey to know how much I could do. And mm. sometimes I still struggle with that self-belief, but I watch the King Richard trailer every day and I think if they did it, <laughs> if they did it, I can do yeah. it. I was talking to a founder of um, a company off the podcast mm. and she was talking about how you need to, you need to let things take their time and the progress yeah. and the change it will happen in its own time. And it's interesting that you say, you're like, oh, I, I wish I've started earlier. And yeah. there's a certain realization of my own that I think, oh, I wish I knew this earlier, yes. how much time it would have saved me. Mm. But I think as a result, it's not as strong a lesson because you might have known it already before, but it just wasn't as crystal clear. Yes. And you needed to have that time to arrive to that for it to really, really kind of stick. Definitely. And mm. I think, you know, you like I, I always say, like, I wish I quit my job sooner, but I was never ready. 
I was never ready to quit. And it was only at this point where I felt, okay, I'm ready, that it was the right decision for me. Mm -hmm. So when people say like, oh, how much money did you have before you did it? I was like, it's nothing to do with that for me. Mm -hmm. It was all to do with like, do I feel that now is the right time? And I'm a very emotional person. So everything is always on my gut and my, my mm -hmm. feeling with my heart. You obviously have to have a kind of plan and you obviously have to have some kind of savings, but that's different for every person. Mm -hmm. And so I really feel that everything happens at the right time. It's just on in hindsight, you wish it all started before. Yeah. With your growing podcast and your growing audience, you know, you are setting a path for for younger women to, to follow and to, you know, and, and being inspirational as well. What... What does leadership mean to you? Well, I think there's different definitions of leadership, but for me, it really means setting an example. So you can't have someone in the room that is saying one thing and doing another. However, there are certain things in the things that I lead on in terms of speaking up that you also have to understand that you can't speak up about everything at all times to all people. And there is an art in the way you speak up about things. So there are certain things that I would say, be yourself, be independent, don't let someone else's opinions control you. And I truly believe that. But if it's someone you love, so for example, my parents, I know feel uncomfortable if I post about my relationship on social media. I just know they do. Mm. And it's not that they've ever told me you can't. I just know that they don't like it if I do, because then the whole world knows about my relationship and people ask them and they don't feel comfortable in that. Now, if I was fiercely passionate about sharing my relationship on social media, then I would be like, I'm going to do it. But I'm not fiercely passionate about that. And so when I talk around, like your question around leadership, if I'm trying to inspire women to speak up, I'm also trying to inspire them to also understand that not every situation you need to speak up in. And there's love and respect for certain people that you should keep. And unless you're so passionate about something, first have a conversation and kind of then break that trust. Don't just do whatever you want, you know, keep those relationships, those friendships, whatever it is in mind. And like in that example, you know, it's not super important to me, so I don't do it. Mm -hmm. And I keep that relationship with my parents. And I make sure I'm needing an example to them to be like, look, I want to teach people that they can be independent. I want to tell people that they can be who they are. There's also different boundaries in place in which I respect you and I understand that. Mm -hmm. And I think leadership is always about sh sharing the truth and always about keeping other people in mind too. So making sure that you're not leading in a way in which you wouldn't want to be led. I hope that answered the question. It does. It's a bit broad. Thank you so much. Thank Shivani, you. it's such a pleasure to meet you and I really wish you all the best. Thank you. With your podcast and your conversations and just being you. Thank you. Thank I appreciate you. that. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What did you discover in this episode? I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments on YouTube or reviews on Apple Podcasts. And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe or follow buttons and I'll see you next week.